long time. I mean, think about this. I, I'm, I'm just going down rabbit trails right now. We'll get to my sermon in a second. Uh, but you think about this. Forever is like a circle, right? Kind of like a marriage. Not a bad marriage, a good marriage. <laughs> it's like a circle. It goes round and round. You have your ups and your downs, but yet you still go through it. God talks about us as being in a marriage with him. That we're going to, we are his bride. He's going to give us a place at his table. He's prepared a place for us. I'm excited about heaven. I don't know about you guys, but when I get a chance to talk about my Lord and Jesus, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I get excited. So tonight's message is going to screw with your minds. <laughs> Absolutely. Because tonight's message that I'm going to talk about, and I walk around so... Uh, you guys are going to have to follow me. Uh, it's called Satan, I'll Take You Back. What? <laughs> I look at these faces now going, what? Well, I want to let you know something. Satan wants me. He does. You know how I know he wants me? Same way that everybody else wants me. He sends people, to my, he sends people my way. He tells me that he wants me. He wants to pull me out of a path, and he likes to tell me that all the things that I know about him, I really don't really know him. That's what he likes to do. He likes to tell me to my face that I'm wrong. Oh, this Jesus stuff is so archaic. Think about it. 2,000 years ago, still written in the scriptures, how's that affecting your life today? It's 2,000 years ago. Why are you even paying attention to something like that? That's what he likes to tell me. He likes to, say, he likes to like, obviously put roadblocks in my way. So he wants to make sure that I get his messages. He likes to put people that when I start sharing the word of Christ, look at me and go, you know what? I just don't believe that stuff. You know, it's just not for me anymore. Not stuff that I want to know about. Oh, you're so past say, do you know, even now, I have been called a racist for believing in Jesus Christ. I mean, they like to throw words, like a bigot. They like to throw words at me, like saying that I am not even a person that knows how to love individuals. But that's what Satan likes to tell me, because I can have this world without all those names attached if I would just lay down my faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, he clearly wants me. How do I know that? Well, Pastor, today you taught John 10.10. 10. Is that a key scripture for most of us? Most of us have that memorized, at least the first half, because the second half, that, that talks about the abundant life. <laughs> but that first half, it simply says, the thief cometh to kill, steal, and destroy. And you know what? That's what Satan does. That's what he does. That's, that is his purpose in life, in my life. And here's what really kind of gets me. I kind of talked about this. That's how he raises his children. That's how Satan raises his children. And people look at me all the time when I talk about the children of Satan. They go, Satanist? Nope, they're everyday people. They're everyday people. You know, we were born into sin. And there's a father of sin. And if that father is of sin, and we're born of sin, then we have a father that is sinful. Now, we talk about our earthly father, but there's a spiritual father behind it. And that father is Satan. And you know what he does? From the moment you're conceived, he starts telling you about how bad you are that you don't deserve the cross and you don't deserve the blood. And you know what? He starts whispering in your parents' ears, you don't need to go to church. You don't need to raise your kids that way. You don't need to do anything like that. You don't have to because remember, that's so 2,000 years ago. You don't have to worry about those kind of things anymore. Matter of fact, I see things around that really, really are, are so exciting, Pastor, in this new day. I'm being sarcastic, by the way. There are signs outside of churches that says, let's redefine church. What are we going to redefine it to? That 
that everything's okay? That sin is not sin in God's eyes? That it's okay to live a life that's outside of sin? See, that's what Satan does to his offspring. Can his offspring be people who are called Christians? Well, they can call themselves Christians. But we know that Christianity is bearing fruit. And if that fruit is not sweet or if it's not bearing, if it's not coming into you and you're not seeing it, guess what? It's either time to trim the tree or cut it down. It doesn't really give you much of a choice. Remember, I'm telling you about his children. I'm not telling you about his demons. I'm not talking about those little things that come in and whisper in your ears, those little nymphs that tell you, oh, do something bad. You know, come on, think about it. You know, nobody's watching. I'm not talking about the spirits that, like, want to move a chair so that we can watch it all on TV and we can get all excited and say, see, there's life after death, but it's not. It's, it's our long dead relatives that are trying to show a sign for us. We get all hooked and we get all into that. Matter of fact, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll watch a good conspiracy theory if there is one out there. I'm hooked on them. But I, I put them to the word. Put things to the word. Because I know for a fact that Satan wants me and desires me. And sometimes I'll tell him, I'll take you back. I'll take you back. You know, I say that and I still get these looks. I still get these people looking at me going, why would you do that? Wasn't your experience with Satan bad enough? I'm like, yeah, it was. But you know, I see it every day. I see people lay down the faith to take the hand of Satan and walk out with him every day. But let me tell you something. We can get confused. A lot of us can get confused about the word of God. Matter of fact, uh, John 8, chapter 8 in the book of John is one of the most confusing scriptures that I've ever read. Because I was always taught, I don't know about you guys, but I know where, I, where my upbringing came from. Jesus is talking to a bunch of Jews. And he's looking at these Jews and he says, you're captive. And they're like, well, we're not captive. We're not captive. We're the seed of Abraham. And if we're the seed of Abraham, we answer to no man. Then he says, who the son sets free is free indeed. And they're like, we're not captured. Who do you think you are? And then he goes and tells them things like, you need to be delivered. Listen, from the moment I was born, they would say to him, I was chosen by God. I am God's chosen people. And they were defiant with him. And Jesus looked at him and said just this to him. He goes, well, let me read that scripture. John 8, 44. Praying that I still have it up. I don't. <laughs> Everybody has an iPad. I'm getting used to working mine again. <laughs> John 8, 44. I read from the King James Version. I know a lot of times people use the New King James Version. I'm just a little old school. It's not a it's not an issue for me if you're reading from a different version. Uh, it says, you, are, you, he's referring to you as the Jews, above your father, the devil. What? Pastor, didn't, didn't they teach him from the moment they were born they were God's chosen people? What's Jesus saying right here? These are God's chosen people. You are the father of the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from, a be from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Tells you three things in there. First of all, he's a liar. We know that. We know that he is a liar. We know that every word that comes out of his mouth is a lie. So how come every time he speaks to us, we run to the pastor? How come every time we get bad news, we go to him? Because 
if it's coming out of the mouth of a deceiver that doesn't line up with the word of God, it's a lie. The Bible says, let everything be a lie, but let God be true. So if he says you're healed, if he says pray, if he says pray for the sick and they shall recover, it's going to happen. It says call unto the elders of the church and let them pray. You know why he says that while you're sick? Because nobody wants to pray when they're sick. Nobody wants to do anything. But you know, it says that. But you know what? I'm still going to tell you something. With all this stuff that I know, Satan, I'll still take you back. I'll still take you back. You know why? Well, hang on. Yeah. You know why? Sometimes in your life, you have to face trials. You know, I'm just going to throw this out here. Sometimes, for a male, he'll bring this hot little thing in front of you, and then you'll start showing a little attention to you, a little day by day. And you start starting to doubt your, your mindset, your wedding vows. You start thinking, hey, maybe I can do something better. And I'm just speaking from a man's point of view, and if you guys are offended, I apologize. I'm just knowing so many people that are willing to throw away a marriage for a hope. I do. And I know I know who's sending that person in. I'm, I know that person that's sending that person in to destroy that marriage. Now his name is Satan, if you guys don't know it. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. And then all of a sudden you start putting expectations on marriages and you start putting expectations upon people that, that you've been had you've been involved with most of all of your life. And what happens is those the expectations become unrealistic. And eventually, you get to the point that you say, I quit. You know, one thing I learned about divorce, and I'm one of these divorcees, and I've, I, I've been through it, and I don't recommend it for anybody. Matter of fact, if you come up and tell me that you, you're in the process or you want a divorce, I will tell you not to do it. I will tell you to do everything else other than. It is, it is the worst experience I've ever experienced in my life. It destroys families, separates them, puts one person over another. And if you think that you're going to be good friends afterwards, that's a joke. Because it's not. Because I'm going to tell you something. You can't be a good friend with somebody until you've been through the fire with them. You can't. And what's the fire do? It hardens, makes things a little stronger. So you can't be a good friend if you're not willing to go through the hardness with them. And, and your spouse and your significant other should be your best friend. And you've been, you've been fought through the fire with each other. I'm looking at Pastor King and uh, Sharon here. I know for a fact, I don't even have to ask. There's been ups and downs. She's been through the fire. So I've been there. I've been there. But here's, here's where I want to take Satan back to. This is where I want to take Satan back to. I want to take Satan back to this moment in my life. I just explained it to you. I, I've been embarrassed about this moment that I was a divorcee. I had a ministry. I was on an elder's board. I thought I was something. I wasn't. What I was was vulnerable. And the whole time I'm going through a divorce, Satan is taking my reputation and everything about me through the mud. You know why mud? and clay because it's heavy he's taking me through there because all he wants me to do is just give up and he keeps dragging me through and keeps dragging me through but here's where I want to take Satan back to it's this place right here not exactly right here but an altar kind of like this where I got down on my hands and knees and I said Jesus I need your help and Jesus came and reached his hand down and pulled me out of clay and my recap clay that I couldn't get out of my own. And he set my feet and established my goings. That's what he did. And he allowed me to go get cleaned up and take all that stuff that I was carrying and wash it off of me because he was ready to bring me back into the kingdom. That's where I'm going to take Satan back to. Not back into my life, but back to the place where he was that's where I'll take Satan back to. See, while I was going through the divorce, I didn't know this. My God's a good God. 
I looked around. I'm telling people, my God's a good God. While I was going through a divorce, there was a young lady looking for a man. And that young lady was back there, and she found me. And she didn't care about what, what my past looked like and what, what it was dressed up like. But she accepted me. We walked an aisle together, and we made commitments, and we both believed divorce is bad, and we're going to go through the ups and downs. God prepared something for me. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that I support divorce, but I will tell you that God says he'll turn everything that's bad into good for you. Amen. See, let me tell you something. I'll take him back to several places in my life. I'll take him back to several places that I've been. See, I'll take him back to places where catch up with my notes. I'll take him back to a place where I was with my best friend, and I was hoping he would be here tonight, and something happened. He's from Oklahoma, and he lived here for the longest time, and we were playing in his basement, and we had an Ouija board, and I was like 12 or 13 years old. I saw the eyes roll. That's great, because I know what they are now. I didn't know what they were then. I'll take him back to that place where all of a sudden, a young Christian who just began to serve Jesus Christ at the age of 13 was not always on the straight and narrow, but learning the ways. And all of a sudden, I realized that I was talking to something that wasn't of God, and I began to challenge it. I still remember it to this day. And the reason why I wanted my friend here, because he would verify it, is that we were sitting there in the middle of the basement, and all of a sudden, I started calling out, saying, you know Lucifer. Now, my friend at that time didn't know who Lucifer was, but the board did, and it said, yes, I do. And then I started calling it a liar. Don't ask me why a 13-year-old would do that. I don't know. I don't have a lot of religious background. I don't have parents that were saved. What I do have is the Holy Spirit telling me and guiding me into all truth, and all of a sudden, we watched that board go out and, and spell some letters that would freak most people out. And at 13, it freaked me out. I'll take him back to that place where that board said K-I-L-L-B-O-B. -B. Kill Bob. I'll tell him. I'll take him back to that place. I'll take him back to that place because as soon as that board came off the ground and nobody was underneath it, and I, being a good friend, left my friend downstairs because it was his board. <laughs> Just being honest. <laughs> And I thought it would be beneficial for me to be in another room, which I ran upstairs. And uh, by the time my friend got up there, which was seconds later, and the, the board crashed into the door, I'll tell you, we burnt the board. I never got her back around it. But I can tell you, a few days later, I was at a friend's party. I'm 13 years old, just a new Christian serving Jesus. I knew that all of a sudden that is not the way to serve Jesus, is to mess around with boards like this. But my friend, that the party I was going to was a birthday party, had a new Ouija board. As soon as I went in there, the board stopped. They got mad. Because you know what? It was a fun game to them. 45 minutes later, the person got angry. Said, I want you to work. 45 minutes after I arrived, it's spelled K-I-L-L-B-O-B. -B. 45 minutes later. 45 minutes later. And all of a sudden, people looked at me and said, what did you do? I don't know why they blame me. I can tell you what I did. I finally found the truth is what I did. I started telling them that that's not a board that you want to play with. Eventually, my friend got rid of her board at the birthday party. I tell these, I've told this story for years. I've told this story over and over and over and over again. Most people like it around Halloween. But you know what? I tell this story over and over and over again. My kids didn't believe me. Didn't believe me at all. I have three kids. Uh, two of them are 20 and one's going to be 17 on Friday. <laughs> we are all 17 months. I remember that. <laughs> so uh, my 20-year-old daughter, she was going New Year's Eve. She was at a friend's party's house, and they got on a Luigi board. I've told her all my life, stay away. But now she's at the place where she can make her own decisions. So she got down on the board and she started asking questions. 
And she thought she'd be a little jokester and say, do you know my dad? This has been 20 years later. The board went K-I-L-L-B-O-B. I'll take Satan back to that place. Because guess what? I'm so worried. Not because I'm scared of what they're going to try to do, because what John 10.10 10 said, he comes to try to kill, steal, and destroy. So I'll take him back to that place. Matter of fact, I'll even go farther than that. I'll take him back to when my kids were twins. I'll take him back when he sent messengers to kill my son twice. I'll take him back to that place where he was defeated when he tried to kill my son in a crib. I'll take him back there. I don't have a problem taking him back there because that was another place that I watched him get defeated. See, I'm gonna take him back to a hospital room with a 19-year-old woman. I'm gonna take him back in 1970 in a hospital room with, where a woman discovered that she was pregnant with her third child and said, you've got two choices because congratulations, you are pregnant and number two, you've got uterine cancer. We have to abort the child. I rem I'll take him back there because that was my mama. My mama said to a doctor in 1970, now I'm going to put this in perspective. In 1970, there was no Roe v. Wade. There was no Roe v. Wade. There was acceptable practice to, to kill a baby in order to preserve a mother's life. Absolutely. But my mom looked at the doctor and said, I'm choosing my baby. I'll take him back to a tree when I was seven years old that I fell out of 16 feet high, broke three branches, hit the ground, shattered my arm, my leg, and popped my eye out. I was told by a doctor, I wasn't told because I wasn't conscious, but my parents were told that for the rest of my life I'd be a vegetable. I'll take him back there. I'll take him back there. I'll take him back to these places where he thought he was going to win a battle and lost. I am tired of people sitting here, I have an ax experience. I'm going to tell you that. I've had Jesus by my side every step that I've taken. I don't know why. I don't know, I don't know how. I wasn't in a praying family. But you know what I discovered? My mom's best friend was a prayer, prayer word. And she would get together with a bunch of prayer individuals. And they would have prayer. And they would pray for the people that she worked with. I thank God for that person. Her name is Pat Tuttle. I hope you guys know her. It's Pat McFarland today. But she was a great woman of God. And if it wasn't for her and meeting up with my mom at work, I wouldn't have had a prayer. Literally. See, I'll take him back. I'll take him back because I don't drool today. I'll take him back to those places where he thought he could win the battle. But most of all, I'll take him back to a place when I said I was 13 years old. I'll take him back to a place where a preacher was in a pulpit. His name was Mark Coleman. I'll take him back because that message that evening was a message about Satan's kingdom called hell. All my friends were all Christians. But I was the last one holding on. I didn't know if it was real. I didn't know what, what to think about it. But I remember that message, and I was sitting back at the Oak Park Church. Actually, it was called the Richmond Church of God at the time, and I was on the, on the according to me, my left side of the building, right side of the church, depending on which way you're looking, and I let go. And I walked up to an altar, and I said, Jesus, if you are real, I want to give my life to you. You know, that was the first day that I let go of Satan's hand. That was the first day that I realized that I didn't have to live in an environment of hatred and, and destruction that I could reach onto my hand, which was Jesus Christ, the man who adopted me, that had the paperwork in order, that paid the price, that took me into his kingdom and said, I love you. For the first time, I found somebody who loved me. I've heard those words but I hadn't seen the demonstrations. 
but throughout my life, I will tell you time and time again, time and time again, the only name that has ever prevailed in every aspect of my life has been Jesus. That is the only thing that I know. That's the only place that I've been. That's the only place that I can tell you that I love to be at. I love studying his word. When I dated my wife, she used to just, I think she tuned me out a lot of times because for hours, I would just tell her what's going on in my spirit. And she would look at me, she'd go, you got any notes on this? I'm like, no. Are you reading from notes? No, because it's all in me. Jesus is all I know. That's all I know. I've been through some trials. I've had some good times and some bad times. I've been in the valley and I've been on the mountaintop. But all the time, I've been walking with his hand. I'm going to share one more story because I want you guys to know that I can show you the places where Satan was defeated. But I'm going to tell you a story about a time where I was driving a car. I can tell you a lot of stories about driving a car, and I probably shouldn't have had a license. <laughs> but I was in a car, and I was feeling defeated. And I was by myself, and it was a rough time. And I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know what else to do. I was driving, that's where I got all my frustrations out. I'd roll the windows out. I would say what was on my mind, and some of those things weren't pleasant, and thank God we have windows and country roads. But I'd be out there, and I'd drive, and that's just one of those nights that I was very frustrated, but I realized something tonight, that about this night was a little different because I was about ready to give up. I was about ready to give in. I was ready to throw in the towel. There was nothing, nothing left I wanted to do. So I just reached down and I was in the car and I was driving down the road and I put my hand over into the passenger's feet and I said, Jesus, will you hold my hand? Will you hold my hand for just a moment? And I felt his hand reach around mine. Felt his hand reach around mine. There's nobody in that car but Jesus. See, I'm going to let you guys know tonight. I don't know if you guys have a little music before you wind up, but I'm about ready to wind down a little bit. But uh, if not, that's fine. I'm going to let you guys know this evening. You can take Satan back. You don't have to take him back into your life. No. You can take him to those points in your life that he's been defeated. You might not have a lot of points. You might not be able to point to certain places where he was trying to kill you or destroy your reputation or try to run you through the mud or try to call you names or try to destroy you from a profession. You know, I'll just be honest. You may not have those, but you may have the cross. You may have the cross where you found him and you can take him back there because he can't get past the cross. He can't give past the cross. If you need Jesus, it's the cross is where you go. It was the last first place I stopped and the first place I go every morning. The cross. It hasn't changed. I'm not talking about where he's nailed to a tree for my sins. I'm not talking about the going back and confessing sins. I'm going back to do what Paul said. Remember where I've been and then pressing on. If you don't have a cross experience tonight, I'm going to ask you real quick. Jesus is not a respecter of persons. And if
if he would take a person like me to the cross, I'd be willing to take a person like you. Because I don't care who you are, what you've done. But I do care about where you're going. You don't have to hold Satan's hand tonight. You don't have to be a part of the accuser. Your self-esteem is bigger than he'll let you know. So tonight, if you need the cross, I'm just asking you to come to this altar. If nobody wants to come, that's fine. I'm going to let you know how to do it. But I'm going to give you the opportunity because sometimes we forget and our past is blurred. But if you want to just take a few moments and pray and thank him for those victories, this altar is open. You don't have to wait for me to stop talking. This altar is open. I want you to know that he loves you more than I could ever love you. But he pointed me to a cross.
if we're seasoned at all, we've been through storms, we've been through difficulties. Sometimes even the youngest people here, Lord God, have been through uh, challenges in their lives. God, remind us of our victories and remind us of your victories and that they're our victories only because we're with you. But they're your victories that you saw us through time and time and time again. And Lord, we're so very grateful to that. Let those things be memorials in your life. Let those things be foundations. And if you're going through a tough time right now, know this. God is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Amen. Amen. I had mentioned this morning that we were going to take up a love offering again tonight. We took one up this morning. Daniel and Danielle were, who are uh, members of our church and are going to be missionaries. You know, when, when Miles was born, uh, Daniel had to take some time off work and his job is commission sales. And if you got no sales, you make no money. And then they brought the baby home and he thought he'd be able to return to work. And boom, the baby immediately started having seizures. And then it's three, four days up at uh, Indianapolis at the Children's Hospital. And so uh, over six days of just missed work and everything else. And uh, we just want to be a blessing to them. I've told people if you've got some food at the house that you know I, I, if I started eating today Carl I'd never be able to eat my way through it all so you know I could probably share some of that you know Shirley was telling me this morning that was sin I said you should be my wife Shirley I tell you the way she was correct in everybody she was practicing this morning she's correct in everybody <laughs> but um, we want to give you an opportunity to give you know um, it's important to be a blessing to one another. It's important to help one another and support one another. So uh, look for that. Look and see if you've got some stuff that you can share and bring in from uh, over the next week. And uh, today, if you can share something in giving, that'll be a great blessing to them. And we appreciate Bob's word. Didn't you appreciate Bob's word? Those personal testimonies, you know, a lot of people they try to bury their testimony yeah, that's not, not scriptural the word says you know why do the righteous suffer why do we go through things like divorce and, and all that other stuff well that's life you know sometimes it, it happens and there's nothing you can do about it you can try to be the best husband or the best wife that you can possibly be and the other person doesn't want to cooperate you know then in all likelihood and then other circumstances and other situations happen. But the work, you know, I, I long asked God, why do we suffer? Why, why, you know, am I going through a sales slump and then I miss six days of work? Uh, you know, why am I divorced? Why this, why that? Uh, God allows those things in our life because they're going to be in everybody else's life. And he says, and I think it's the first chapter of 2 Corinthians that the comfort with which we have been comforted were to use to comfort others. You know, with, with the way God got us through it, we're to share with others. You know, that, hey, God won't give up on you. God will see you through it. God will walk with you all the way. Amen? But if you never talk about your sufferings, if you never talk about the difficulties you've had in your life, then you're disobeying God's word because you're not comforting others with the comfort with which you were comforted. Amen? So, you know, don't uh, bury uh, those, those uh, precious gems that God has made at different places in your life. You know, the only way they say, chemically, I think it's true, you know, a diamond is essentially made up as the same thing as coal. Uh, there's a little difference. Under extreme pressure and heat, the coal becomes a diamond. And uh, under extreme, and <laughs> I, won't, I won't even go there. <laughs> under extreme pressure and heat, those times in your life that you've been under the pressure or, and under the heat and squeezed on every side, that, that's God making jewels in your life. Maybe jewels for your crown. 
Amen? Hey, we got a runner. We're Pentecostal tonight. <laughs> we got a runner. Father, we thank you for this word. It was an encouragement to all of us, Lord. And Father, we ask you to bless this, uh, this offering tonight to, to uh, a couple here in our church, Lord, that love you, serve you, and are going to go and be missionaries someday for you, Lord God. Father, bless every gift and every giver. Bless Bob and his wife, Lord, and his children, their family, Lord God. And Father, just continue to work uh, as, marvelly, as marvelously in their life as you have. And God, continue just to knit us all closer together in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to take up this offering. Remember again, what all is coming up. We have, um, yeah, he'll come up there. We have, um, next week we will have our class on, um, we will have our class on the, um, Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit at 5 o'clock. Then at 6 o'clock, uh, Drew Atkins will be preaching or ministering. He's a young man in the revival. That should be exciting. I don't know how many.